of matter. So networks exist in both physical and conceptual spaces. Uh, those networks can be treated as static and fixed, but in many cases evolve appreciably over a variety of timescales. In this talk, I will discuss the evolution of networks in matter and mind. First, I will discuss principles by which to design mechanical networks that undergo precise and predefined conformational changes. Second, I will discuss connections between networks of matter and networks of mind and relations among both physical and conceptual spaces, drawing on my forthcoming book from MIT Press. Third, I will discuss empirical studies of evolving networks of mind as manifest in how scientists cite the work of other scientists in the reference lists of their peer-reviewed papers, including relative imbalances in how we cite the work of gender, racial, and ethnic minorities. Collectively, the work will provide a conceptual framework for understanding evolving networks in matter and mind with important implications for our understanding of our physical world and the processes of scientific inquiry. And to begin, I'd like to read this passage from Aristotle's Metaphysics, where he writes, mind thinks itself because it shares the nature of the object of thought, for it becomes an object of thought in coming into contact with and thinking its objects, so that mind and object of thought are the same. Now, this passage, I think, is a beautiful example of conformational change in mind as mind becomes an object. And I'd like to begin our time tonight or this afternoon by taking our object of thought to be matter. As the mind becomes matter, so matter also becomes other matter. But how does matter actually do this becoming? A natural process of becoming is that of conformational change. It allows proteins in biology to have complex functions, engineered materials to have immense capabilities, and even sculptures to have beauty. Across biology, materials, physics, and art, the capacity to undergo a conformational change provides flexible and actuatable function. But how do we design networks that enact conformational changes to ensure that they achieve desired functions? There are two common prior approaches to this problem. The first is kinematic synthesis, which can be used to determine the size and configuration of mechanisms that shape the flow of power through a mechanical system or machine to achieve a desired performance. The primary limitation of this approach is that it scales poorly with the number and heterogeneity of elements. The second common approach to this design problem is called algorithmic tuning, which can be used to determine the number and identity of elements to add or to remove or to place elsewhere to alter mechanical response. The primary limitation of this approach is that it is limited to small motions of a few elements or to periodic and uniform maneuvers. Both of these approaches underscore the fact that designing motions in mechanical systems is difficult. But while the design of desired motions is difficult, the underlying theory of how such motions arise is as simple as counting. In two-dimensional space, each node can move in two directions, thereby adding two motions, while each edge fixes the length between its connecting nodes, thereby removing one motion. Hence, a system uh, containing four nodes and four edges, adds eight motions and removes four motions to yield a total of four motions. Among these four are the three rigid body translations and rotation that maintain the distance between all of the nodes. And then the fourth is a conformational motion that changes the lengths between unconnected nodes. To unlock the full potential of mechanical functions, we need design principles that allow us to coordinate motions across many nodes, as is often seen in biological systems such as enzymes. So hence we want to answer, this, answer the question, how do we combine many nodes and many edges to design precise conformational changes? Unfortunately, the equation governing the geometry of shape changes is the distance between nodes, which is nonlinear in the node position. But then to tackle a nonlinear question, we simply must use a nonlinear method. So specifically what we will do over the next few minutes is to use methods from nonlinear dynamics to determine the conformation of many units using a single map. As a specific example, let's study our four node unit K here in a little bit more detail. 
We'll call the length between the top node and the bottom node LK, and the length between the left node and the right node LK plus one. As we change LK from square root of two to two, we notice that L of K plus one also changes from square root of two to two. If we plot LK plus one versus LK, we draw a curve F that is a map from LK to LK plus one. And then if we fix LK to any specific length, we know the exact shape of the entire unit here. For example, at the yellow point up at the top here, both LK and LK plus one equal two. Hence, if we fix LK equal two, we know exactly what LK plus one will be. And additionally, then, if we combine units together, not just having one, but having many, then we can control the shape of many units by just fixing one of the lengths, the initial LK. So then we can ask the question, what conformations and conformational trajectories are possible for each current configuration? What we'll do is that we will combine units by joining their nodes such that the shape of each unit is determined precisely by the shape of the first unit. So for any unit K, we'll call the nodes defining LK the head and the nodes defining F of LK the tail. The first unit K equals one then maps L1 to F of L1. And if we add a second unit, k equals two, and join the head of unit two to the tail of unit one, the lengths become equal such that L2 equals F of L1. Hence, the shape of the second unit is a function of the first unit. We can keep extending the chain by joining the head of unit k to the tail of unit k plus one, thereby enforcing the relationships between lengths. L k plus one is F to the k of L1. So hence, the shape of every unit is determined by the head length of the first unit. For example, if we set L1 equal to 2, then because the unit maps F of 2 to 2, all subsequent lengths are also 2, and the network forms this beautiful periodic lattice. However, if we change the initial head length L1 such that L1 is something less than 2, then all of the subsequent lengths become L2 is F of L1, and then L3 is going to be F of F of L1, until the units eventually converge to the shape corresponding to a length LK equals square root of 2. So hence, by changing L1, we have modified the shape of all of the nodes according to our map F. But why did those lengths move away from two and in fact move towards the square root of two? What are the key features of our map F that determine what our network will look like? Intuitively, we know from this map that the points that are yellow here or blue here are special. They are where a unit maps a length to itself. These points are called fixed points, and as we observed before, if L1 starts at a fixed point, then LK remains at a fixed point, forming a periodic lattice. Additionally, if a fixed point is stable, then a change in L1 yields a smaller change in L2, and the lengths converge to a point. Alternatively, if the fixed point is unstable, then a change in L1 yields a larger change in L2, and the lengths will diverge from that point. So hence, the fixed points determine periodic lattices, and their stability determines whether or not the network will converge to that lattice. Now, using this approach, we can characterize and assemble an existing unit, but how do we design units that assemble together with one another to yield desired macroscopic shape changes? In the previous network that we were just discussing, we observed that at the two fixed points, the networks form two lines. To design networks with more interesting and complex shapes, we have to divine, design more interesting and complex units. So here we begin with three nodes, node one, node two, and node three. We'll define the lengths between node one and node two as L1, and we'll define the length between node two and L node three as L2. We fix the start and end positions of these nodes such that the initial lengths are the same. So L1 is going to be the same as L2, and we'll just call that L bullet. We will also um, have the final lengths be the same as well. Um, so L1 of this dashed line here, so that's the final length, is going to be the same as the final length L2, which is going to be, we'll call it L circ. 
Um, by doing so, we are fixing these two points as fixed points, where L bullet equals F of L bullet, and then L circ equals F of L circ. Then we can ask, where should we place new nodes and maybe new edges between the new nodes and the original nodes, such that we can enforce a desired movement from the start to the end positions as the only conformational motion? So we're starting again with these three nodes and we have two fixed edges. Um, but what we want to do is to ask where else could we put nodes and new edges such that only our desired conformational motion is possible. To answer that question, we identify the solution spaces, which will be points for movements in a one dimension, conic sections for movements in two dimensions and quadratic surfaces for movements in three dimensions. By adding nodes along the solution space, each unit has one conformational motion where these gray nodes start and end at the desired positions. Now we can recall that both units were designed to start at a fixed point, L1 equals L2 equals L bullet, and then they were meant to end at another fixed point, L1 equals L2 equals L circ. However, each unit ends at a very different bottom length C, which is what I'm showing you here. So this particular unit will end at this bottom length C, and this unit will end with this bottom length C. So by combining different units, by joining the nodes to finding L1 and L2, we can create network chains that both begin and end at the fixed points and whose curvature is determined by these different values of C. For example, just to make this a little bit more concrete, suppose we want to create a network chain that traced out a quadrifolium or a four-leafed clover. How would we go about designing such a network? The idea is to break apart the network into connected units and then to design each unit to end at the same fixed point at lengths L1 and L2, but to end at different length C to generate this curvature. So first, what we do is that we'll tessellate the desired curve with these isosceles triangles, where the corners of each triangle correspond to the final positions of the gray nodes for each unit. Here, the shared isosceles edges, which are gold in this figure right here, um, between triangles correspond to lengths L1 and L2, while the non-shared edge corresponds to the length C, and that's the one that's generating the curvature. So now we generate a range of solution spaces for a continuum of final node positions. And here are all of those, that, that range of solution spaces. Um, then we combine those units in the same series as specified by this original tessellation. In sum, by generating a range of solution spaces for a continuum of final node positions, we can tessellate any arbitrary curve with combined units such that the system maneuvers to the desired shape using only local information. So here's an example of the quadrifolium unfolding. So this approach that I've just described has broad practical utility. In the first instantiation, which was published in 2019, we developed the simple mathematical principles to design mechanical systems that achieve any desired coordinated motion. That approach allows us to design networks with negative Poisson's ratio and allosteric response, specific desired geometric configurations, and both tri-stability and cooperativity. In the second instantiation, which was just published this year, we designed different folding sequences from a soliton to a branched network acting as a mechanical AND gate. We also construct physical networks from laser cut acrylic, origami, and 3D printed material to demonstrate the framework's potential and versatility for designing the full conformational trajectory of morphing metamaterials and structures. We're particularly excited about the connection to um, the mechanical AND gate, as it allows us to think a little bit more deeply um, about um, uh, logic and information in mechanical systems. So with that, I'd like to move on to the second part of the talk, connections between matter and mind. And as we transition here, what I would like to do is to ask whether the intuitions that we gleaned in that first section are sequestered to the mechanics of matter alone um, or are more broadly relevant. And to answer that question, I want to read to you a passage from Arthur Benson's biography of Rossetti. 
So in describing Rossetti's writing, he says, we find such lines as the unfettered irreversible goal or sleepless with cold commemorative eyes. Note such textures as, oh, what is this that knows the road I came, the flame turned cloud, the cloud returned to flame, the lifted shifted steeps and all the way that draws round me at last this wind warm space and in regenerate rapture turns my face upon the devious coverts of dismay. Or, ah, who shall dare to search through what sad maze thenceforth their incommunicable ways follow the desultory feed of death. And so then Benson is talking again after quoting Rossetti and he says, you know, it will be observed in these last quotations, there is a certain slight shifting of the use, the usual meaning of words like commemorative or regenerate and incommunicable, some slight nuance added to them, which is not found in ordinary speech. This preciosity has a charm of its own, and upon this handling of language, this delicate straining of the use of words, depends much of the pleasure derivable from the work of masters of elaborate style. So this passage calls us to think about the straining of words or the shifting of meanings by their context, just as we think about the shifting of matter in mechanical systems. And as we consider conformational change in mechanical networks, we can ask, is there an analogous process in the mind? To make things more concrete, we can think of the gray nodes as words we know we wish to use, and the purple nodes as words we could use to constrain the meaning in other words, just like those purple ones were constraining the movements of the gray ones. So the position of each node thus encodes its meaning, and the movement of each node denotes a change in meaning. As the passage illustrates, words can change their meaning within a passage depending on what other words are used around them. So how do we determine the coordinates and then by extension the movements of words, and how do we determine in what space they live? Google's word to vec provides a really great answer. word to vec trains shallow, two-layer neural networks to reconstruct the linguistic contexts of words. It takes as its input a large corpus of text and produces a vector space, typically of several hundred dimensions, with each unique word in the corpus being assigned a corresponding vector in the space. Now, what is really neat about this approach is that word vectors are then positioned in the vector space such that words share, that share common contexts in the corpus are located close to one another in the space, and words that do not share a common context are located far from one another in the space. But beyond the locations of words, we might wish to understand their mechanics, which requires us to have a meaningful notion of distance. And perhaps even more than a notion of distance, we might want to know that we can perform simple conceptual arithmetic in this space. For example, if we add and subtract word vectors, do we obtain word vectors that encode the addition and subtraction of meaning? The answer, somewhat amazingly, is yes. So if we take the vector for France and subtract the vector for Paris and add the vector for Rome, then we obtain the vector for Italy. Moreover, if we take the vector for kings, plural, and subtract the vector for king, singular, and then add the vector for person, then we obtain the vector for people. And finally, if we take the vector for king and add the vector for woman and subtract the vector for man, then we obtain the vector for queen. So these simple arithmetic facts demonstrate that changing locations in space changes meaning in a formal manner that's consistent with mathematics and with our conceptions of physical spaces. As a quick brief side note, the verity of arithmetic with word vectors is actually a really wonderful contemporary take on a piece from Leibniz, which is called the Dialogue on the Connections Between Things and Words, which he published in 1677. If you haven't read it yet or um, haven't read it recently, I highly recommend. So now that we formally can think about changes in meaning in this conceptual space, we can ask what factors can and do change meanings and concepts. Well, certainly, as we've discussed, a single passage can stretch or strain or change the meaning of a word. But over longer timescales, a book can significantly change how we think and the meaning we assign to objects or concepts and values. I'm particularly thinking of Ben Barr's wonderful autobiography of himself as a transgender scientist. 
And then over even longer time scales, culture can significantly change how we think and the meaning we assign to objects, concepts, and values. And I'm particularly thinking here of the book Cultures Without Culturalism, The Making of Scientific Knowledge, which is by Kareem Chalma and Evelyn Fox Keller. Together, meanings and concepts can change over very different timescales and due to many different factors. So here are just a few examples. First, relevant to curiosity. Consider the word imply. So in the 14th century, imply meant to enfold or to enwrap or to entangle, but the meaning to involve something unstated as a logical consequence was first recorded around 1400, and then the meaning of to hint at, which is the way we would typically use it now, is from about the 1580s. As another example, let's think of a word relevant to society. Consider the word impertinent, one of a favorite of mine. In the 14th century, impertinent meant unconnected, unrelated, and not to the point. The sense of rudely bold, uncivil, and offensively presumptuous is from the 1680s, from an earlier sense of not appropriate to the situation which was from the 1580s. Notice actually from both of these that the 1580s is clearly the time for living when all the words are changing their meaning. But as an example then that is relevant, not to curiosity, not to society, but to science, I'd like to talk about not something that has changed, but something that really needs to change. And that is our shared conception of the word scientist. In our culture, the word scientist is someone who appears masculine. And why would I say that? Well, that meaning was made clear by a recent study where pictures of actual faculty members in STEM at elite universities were rated for masculinity and femininity. A separate group of participants then rated the same images for likelihood of being a scientist versus an early childhood educator. The investigators found that participants assumed that feminine looking women were early childhood educators and more masculine looking women were more likely to be scientists. But the term scientist in our culture does not only mean masculine, but also is a man. And again, why would I say that? In a recent study of 1,224 letters written for 452 postdoctoral applications by 1,101 recommenders from 54 countries over the period 2007 to 2012, women applicants were only half as likely to receive excellent letters versus good letters. The men were described as being brilliant, rising stars, pioneers, geniuses, and trailblazers, whereas the women were described as having a solid skill set, having a good track record, having strong knowledge, intelligence, and an aptitude for learning. But in our culture, scientists are not only assumed sort of implicitly by, by many to be masculine and also to be men, but they are also assumed to have, to have a name commonly given to a man. This is a really interesting study that was published by Moss Rakusin in 2012 in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. What the investigators did is that they used a randomized double-blind study of 127 faculty in physics, biology, and chemistry departments at research-intensive universities. Um, each of those faculty were asked to rate the application materials of a student for a laboratory manager position. Now, the key variable that was manipulated was the name at the top of the CV. So the CV was the same, but the name at the top um, was either commonly given to a man or commonly given to a woman. Interestingly, what the investigators found is that the CV assigned the woman's name was deemed less competent and less hireable. The student was offered less mentoring and was offered $3,700 less in salary than the identical CV that had a man's name on the top. This is really interesting because this is not the privilege of a gender. It's not the privilege of a lived experience. It is simply the privilege of a name. And I wanted to pause here at that evidence um, and transition to the final section of my talk. But it, to do that, I want to first quote Maya Angelou who said, the truth is no one of us can be free until everybody is free. And so here I'd like to move into evolving networks of mind in the context of how science is done. We um, know from many ongoing studies and many past studies that there is a major problem in the culture of academia generally, but science specifically. And the studies that I just mentioned are only three of many, many similar studies. 
Prior work has reported both gender and racial and ethnic inequalities in academia and in industry in terms of compensation, in terms of grant funding, credit for collaborative work, teaching evaluations, hiring and promotion, productivity, authorship, and citations. What's really interesting about this part of the field is that the ongoing conversation still largely focuses on the role of people in positions of power. So journal editors, grant reviewers and agencies, department chairs, society presidents. Um, and it is true that those groups do carry much responsibility. But the fact is that many of the imbalances that exist can be caused and perpetuated by researchers at all levels, um, meaning perpetuated by people like you and me. So where is an example of something that maybe all of us could be contributing to? Citations is one of them. And I wanted to raise this particular path, paper from Cassidy Sujimoto and colleagues that was published in Nature entitled Global Gender Disparities in Science. What the investigators did is that they studied over 5 million research papers and review articles with 27, over 27 million authorships. They find that papers with women in key authorship positions are cited less than papers with men in key authorship positions. And the investigators found this to be true, whether the paper under consideration was a single authored paper, a paper from a national collaboration, or a paper from an international collaboration. So why does that citation gap matter? Why would I be raising it uh, today? Well, I like to follow what Sarah Ahmed um, describes as citations as academic bricks. How are citations academic bricks? Well, I think they are so in two ways. One is that they are basic building blocks of academic careers being important um, for a person's success, for their compensation, their promotion, for grant and other funding awards, for collaborative opportunities, and for speaking invitations. But citations are more than just that. They are also academic bricks in the sense that they are building blocks of fields of inquiry. So what citations do is that they map scholarly fields they define spaces of inquiry, they determine the scope of questions being considered, and they record a history of scientific ideas. So as academic bricks then, in these two senses, citations can build a more diverse scientific community, or they can erect walls of exclusion. So in thinking about why the citation gap matters, I want to ask, whether these same kinds of trends of the citation gap that were observed by Cassidy are also observed in individual fields. Is it true in physics? Is it true in neuroscience? Is it true in geoscience? Is it true in communications? Um, or is it something that's being driven by one field more than others? To answer that question, I'm going to go through a couple different studies that have been published recently um, that provide evidence that this is something that happens very commonly across different fields. So first, this one um, from Jordan Dworkin, published in 2020 in Nature and Neuroscience. Um, the figure over here along the y-axis has the percent over and under citation, and then along the x-axis is the first and last author category. So man-man means a first author man, last author man paper, um, whereas woman-woman means that a woman is in the first author position and in the last author position. And what you can see, um, they describe the uh, is that we find that reference lists tend to include more papers with men as first and last author than would be expected if gender were not a factor in referencing. And importantly, we show that this over-citation of men and under-citation of women is driven largely by the citation practices of men and is increasing over time as the field becomes more diverse. And you can see that increasing um, citation gap here from 2009 to 2018. Here's a similar paper now in Nature Astronomy from 2017. And what you can see along the y-axis is the measured or predicted um, number of citations for the paper. And along the x-axis is the year, now from 1960 to 2015. And the authors state, we measure an average intrinsic bias of 10%, implying that women systematically receive 10% fewer citations than would be expected if they were men, given the non-gender specific properties of their papers. And those other properties that are being taken into account include the um, uh, seniority of the authors on the paper, whether the paper was a review article or an empirical paper, um, the date that the paper was published, the journal in which the paper was published, and several other factors. 
Here's another example from the Journal of Cognitive Neuroscience, very similar trends. And the authors state the results indicate that papers authored by men as the first and last author have been oversighted compared with what would be expected based on the number of papers published by the journal um, that were authored by MM teams. By contrast, papers authored by teams with at least one woman in the first or last author position have been undersighted. Here's an example from medicine. This one just came out in 2021 from Chatterjee and colleagues in JAMA. And the authors state in this cross-sectional study of over 5,000 articles, those written by women primary and senior authors had fewer citations than those written by men primary and senior authors. Articles written by women as both primary and senior authors had approximately half the number of citations as those authored by men as both primary and senior authors. Here's another example in the field of communications. So using data from 14 communications journals from 1995 to 2018, we find that reference lists include more papers with men as first and last author and fewer papers with women as first and last author than would be expected if gender were unrelated to referencing. And then a few other fields, international relations, political and social science, and then another one in international relations. So the first one states um, that they find women are systematically cited less than men after controlling for a large number of variables, including the year of publication, venue of publication, substantive focus, theoretical perspective, methodology, tenure status, and institutional affiliation. They also state that articles authored by women are systematically less central than articles authored by men, all else being equal. And this is likely because men who take up a disproportionate share of the um, scholars in that field tend to cite men more than women. In political science, um, Michelle Dion wrote a paper in 2018, um, and they write, analyzing all articles published from 2007 to 2016 in several journals, we find that female scholars are significantly more likely than mixed gender or male author teams to cite research by their female peers. And then in international relations, Mitchell wrote a paper in 2013 showing that empirical analyses suggest that male authors of two of the journals um, in the field are less likely to cite work by female scholars in comparison with female scholars. So there seems to be from these two an indication of some homophily in the pattern of citations occurring. So we then wanted to know if this was something that was happening along other dimensions of difference. So not just gender, um, but importantly, along the dimension of race and ethnicity. So this is work that was led by Max Bertolero when he was a postdoc in the lab. And what he did is that he took um, a large database of articles and again predicted the um, gender and now race and ethnicity of the first and last authors. Along the y-axis here is the first author. You'll see that there are four racial or ethnic categories, white, Asian, Hispanic, and black. The first four would be the um, man gender category. And then in the next four, you'll have the woman gender category. And then along the x-axis, is the last author. Again, the same for um, racism slash ethnicity. And then the first four will be the, the man author categories and the next four will be the woman author categories. So what you can see here very clearly is that there's a block diagonal structure of the matrix where there's a lot of reds and pinks in the top left and a lot of darker blues in the bottom right. That is a gender effect. So um, the top left square is where you have men in both the first and last author position, and the bottom right square is where you have women in the first and last author position. So there's definitely a gendered effect, but beyond that, we can see variation according to race and ethnicity. And in particular, I'll just pull out the top and the bottom. So the most oversighted is when there's a white man in the first and last author position, and the most undersighted is when there's a black woman in the first and last author position. The difference in the citation percentage between the two is over 70%. Um, so as you can imagine, that could have a very large impact on the Black woman's scholarly career. Importantly, also, that racial and ethnic gap in citations is growing with time, not closing. But we can ask the last question that I wanted to address today for you is, is this happening in physics? That's probably what we care about um, in this particular uh, context. So this is work that was led by Aaron Tyke is now on archive. Here's the backdrop that I wanted to show you. So in over 1 million articles in 35 journals, um, these journals were in areas of general physics, um, AMO, uh, condensed matter, nuclear physics, high energy physics, soft matter or biophysics, nanoscience, and astronomy. 
what you see along the x-axis is the year from 1995 to 2020. Along the y-axis here, you have the particular journals that we studied, and the color indicates the proportion of papers that have a woman in either the first or the last position. What we find is that general physics, AMO, and HEP um, have the lowest proportions of papers with a woman as first or last author. In contrast, nanoscience and astronomy have the highest proportions. Many, interestingly, have stayed relatively stable over the last 25 years and haven't changed um, in the demographics um, in these journals. We then uh, plotted the percent over and under citation of two author groups, papers that have a predicted man in the first and last author position and those that have a woman in either first or last. Using, we used a model that predicts the paper's expected citation rates according to a set of characteristics that are separate from the author gender. And then we find a global bias wherein the papers authored by women are significantly undersighted and papers authored by men are significantly oversighted. Really interesting though, we, we find that the citation behavior varies along several dimensions, um, such that imbalances differ according to who is citing, where they are citing, and how they are citing. I don't have time to go through all of this today, but I did want to pull out in particular the difference across fields. So specifically, the citation imbalance in favor of man authored papers is highest for papers authored by men, for papers published in general physics journals and papers um, likely to be less familiar to citing authors. To see that effect of general physics, I wanna call your attention to this plot on the right-hand side where we have the percent over and under citation. And then in color, I'm showing the um, field. So the largest discrepancy between the two is in general physics. AMO is next, then condensed matter, then nuclear, et cetera. The citation gender gap in general physics, I should also mention, is, is 14%. So an interesting question is, what can we do? Our results point toward a couple specific actions that could be taken by individuals and journals to mitigate this inequity. The first one is an individual action, um, and that is what's called a citation diversity statement. For individuals, we advocate for a really thoughtful engagement um, with the gender makeup of published reference lists. And we highlight um, an increasingly common accountability measure that's being used called the citation diversity statement. There's code available on GitHub if you're curious. It allows you to study your own reference list for a paper and evaluate whether you are close to um, the uh, benchmarks in your subfield um, or far distant from it. And if you're far distant from it, you could consider whether there are people that you um, have missed along the way. Um, we also note that special care needs to be taken when referencing work that lies outside of one's primary area, because what we find in the context of physics is that in these cases, the overcitation of man-authored papers is especially high. We tend to be, do much better as a field in physics when we are citing closer to our own expertise. But when we're citing farther from our expertise, we tend um, to show more bias. Another individual action that is very concrete and straightforward is just to cite more. So what we find is that longer reference lists tend to display less over-citation of man-authored papers, suggesting an implicit gendered meritocracy, whereby man-authored papers are viewed as more deserving than the women-authored papers when resources, which is the reference list length, is limited. Here, what you're seeing is the percent over and under citation as a function of reference list. And when the reference list is quite small, um, there is a marked under citation of papers that have a woman in the first or last um, author category, whereas um, that is mitigated with longer reference lists. So while addressing the potential implicit gendered meritocracy, individual researchers could choose to just cite more papers when allowed um, to broaden engagement with other scientists and work more toward citation equity. In addition to those individual factors, we also found one really interesting um, correlate for journals themselves. So in addition to considering these reference list lengths, 
um, and in fact, journals could consider expanding that now that we have mostly online journals, um, perhaps there doesn't need to be a limit of 50 articles in the reference list. Um, but in addition to that, publishing journals can recommend um, the inclusion of citation diversity statements and work more towards equitable representation in their author pool with the aim of mitigating citation imbalance in their current and future articles. So why would we recommend um, an equitable representation in their author pool? Well, what we find is that if we plot here along the x-axis, the fraction of papers that have a woman in the first or last author position um, against along the y axis, the percent over and under citation of that group, what we find is a positive relationship. Every data point here is a journal. So what we find is that the journals that have that publish more articles from women don't tend to undersite women and the articles or the sorry the journals that have very few women authors being published in them. Um, that journal tends to on average um, undersite women so. This is a correlative finding. However, it does motivate a testable hypothesis, which is that if the representation in the journal is altered to be more equitable, it's possible that the citation um, balance would come along with that. So that was the last piece of data that I really wanted to show you in the third and final section of the talk. So now I just want to broaden back out and summarize what we've done over the last few minutes. So we came in um, today uh, and walked over a passage from Aristotle that took us into conformational control of mechanical networks. We then took a transition across author Benson into studying networks of matter and mind and how they are related to one another in physical and conceptual spaces. We then transitioned across Maya Angelou into a call for conformational change in mind in the context of how we do science. If you are curious um, and are interested in, in sort of pointers for where to go from here from that last section, you can check out a paper that we have um, published in 2020 in Trends in Cognitive Science or TICS, and also a paper from Jordan Dworkin in 2020. These two are perspective pieces rather than empirical pieces and provide some um, recommendations for uh, moving forward. So with that, I'd like to um, stop here and make that I think we have some time for uh, questions if you're curious. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much. Questions? Yes, I have one question. Uh, already placed this on the chat. So uh, in your talk, uh, you have pretty much um, missed the citation or just let's say a reference to artificial life discipline which is about coevolution of motor system sensor system and mind in and there is a lot of underlining in emergence of features so could you please possibly comment how this methodology can be incorporated into described results thank you yeah, um, that's a really good point. So there, it is interesting to think about the evolution of meaning in regard to artificial intelligence. Um, this particular paper that you have cited here, I have not read, um, so I can't comment on that particular one. But I do think that um, understanding that, I mean, meaning, meaning changes, you know, differently for each of us and so would also make sense to be changing in artificial intelligence too and it also changes over very different time scales for each of us um, so sometimes we'll have a um a word that we use with a different meaning even within the same sentence for example so super super short time scale right um, but then we also have changes in meaning that occur over centuries or over uh, millennia um, so i think uh, this is just to say that I agree that there is a much broader, um, there could have been so much more said about how meaning changes, the different ways in which it changes, how it changes differently for um, natural intelligence versus artificial intelligence. Um, so yes, thank you for raising that. Thank you. Uh, Naomi? Thanks a lot for a really cool talk. I loved all, all three parts and the juxtaposition and connections between them. Um, one thing that I noticed uh, in your um, block diagonal chart uh, with the citations in the third part is that 
um, the, the over citation values for between, I think it was um, white men citing black men and black men citing white men were nearly the same as white men citing white men. And, and I was just wondering if, if you had any hypothesis for why that might be when the other two uh, uh, like male, male categories didn't seem to reflect the same thing. Yeah, let, uh, I think maybe I'll just pull that one up so that everybody can, um, can see that one more time. Um, yeah, so what you're pointing out is that the over-citation here, when the last author is a white man and the first author is a um, black man, is pretty high and actually fairly consistent with what happens when the first author is a white man. Um, there's also this one where um, if, the, if a black man is uh, in the last author position and a white man is in the first author position, it's also pretty high. Um, so my sense here is that it's not necessarily about white and black, um, but that there is a marked um, uh, cost um, for Asian uh, men. So that's the, that's the sort of blue section here. Um, so that to me suggests that you know, I sort of see this block as mostly red and mostly pretty high red, except um, for Asian men. And so that's a really interesting observation. Um, I don't know why that is the case, um, but that seems to be something that, that's quite important. Um, and I should clarify that this isn't um, these people citing these people, it's the field citing papers that have the, a person of this first author category and that last author category. Okay, my bad. Yeah, I, I think I misinterpreted that. It's actually also interesting that in addition to the, the, the Asian strips that, that you showed, the Hispanic, Hispanic uh, also seems very low. Yes, the Hispanic, Hispanic is also low. Yes, agreed. Yep. Elizabeth? Hi, thanks for the Hi. talk. This was really, really informational. Um, I actually had a question on the same slide as Naomi did. Mm, okay. Should I put it back up? <laughs> yeah, that would be great. Okay. Go ahead. I was wondering about your statement here that these effects are increasing with time. And I was wondering mm -hmm. if you had any more data about that and also any ideas about what forces might be driving this to be getting worse. Yeah, I'm so glad that you asked. Um, so, uh, yes, one of the, there are a couple different things that are happening. Um, so uh, one effect is that there seems to be a growing racial and ethnic homophily in collaborative networks. So white people are writing more papers with other white people um, and people of color are writing more papers with other people of color. That's a, that's increasing since 1995. Um, but actually the much bigger effect that we see is that um, fields tend to be citing as if it's 1995. So the, the sort of makeup of our reference lists are really similar to what the demographics were like in 1995. Um, but a wonderful thing about the last, um, you know, two and a half decades is that um, the actual diversity of our faculty has changed a lot. So um, if we cite like it's 1995 and our field is growing in diversity, then the citation gap will be increasing. Um, so that's, that's the biggest explanatory variable right now that we can find. That to me points to um, a something practical to do, um, which is to make sure that we know who the young people are. Um, so the people who just got a faculty position in the last, you know, five years. I often tend to think of people who are my age or older um, as, as people I know who I've known for a really long time. I know their work, I know their lab, I know that their students come work with me, you know, um, and what I need to be doing is to make sure that I know the people who are younger than me, who have just gotten the, the faculty jobs um, and whose work I may not automatically be as familiar with um, just because of the, the time factor involved. So, yes. Stephen? Yeah, you focused on citations, but 
my impression is that the discrepancies are even bigger in referee and how articles are judged um, by referees based on gender or ethnic characteristics. Do you have any comment on that or recommendations about what can be done about that? Yeah, that's a really great um, point. It's not, we I coll have collaborated on one paper um, that is uh, a preprint now um, that does evaluate these sorts of things. It's actually, in this case, it's not reviewers, it is the editorial board and the editorial decisions. Um, and we find significant um, gender disparities and, and inequities there. So, um, you know, I think that it's, 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 it's obviously these sorts of um, structures are everywhere. And what's important is just to be increasingly aware of them and how each of us contributes to them. I think what I really like about the citation area is that it's something that I can do something about in my own work. Whereas, um, you know, I'm not the head of a journal, so I can't do something huge and drastic. I'm not a society president, so I can't do something huge and drastic there either. Um, but I feel that there's something very practical and 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 close nearby, something immediate that I can do to address something like citations. But it's not to to minimize the fact that there are um, similar uh, inequalities elsewhere. I just have one follow up on that. Given the statistics you've shown, do you have any comment about the use of citations or citation statistics for evaluating academic careers? <laughs> Yeah, well, I think that they're um, a very in, in, um, imperfect measure of a person's value, clearly. Um, and so I think, I mean, I've had some interesting conversations with other scholars about, well, shouldn't we, should we be pushing for citation equity or should we be pushing for the removal of the H index and, and the dismissal of citations everywhere, <laughs> you know? Um, but I think, I think it's sort of... Um, I land more on the, I would like to actively um, engage with the scholars in my field in a way that is fair um, and not driven by gender or race and ethnicity. Um, and that that's a more proactive thing than, than, you know, let's not look at citations ever. Because, and I, do, I just don't think that that's very practical. I don't think that's something that anybody I, I don't know. I just, you can't, the numbers won't go away. They're not going to just disappear. Um, people will always be using them in their minds implicitly to evaluate others. And I think what's more important is just to acknowledge that that happens and to address it in ourselves and to say, well, yes, I had that thought about that person, but I'm going to acknowledge that that number is imperfect and that there are lots of reasons why that number might be different for this person from this demographic category than this person. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Ed? Hi. Very Hi. good to know. I, I, I love the heterogeneity of it. And the, it's good uh, time to you, put together. You, you, um, you pushed my brain. I, I'm thinking two things. One is um, the inertia uh, and whether you teased out for that because people get cited more than have been cited. So there's, there's that. And then I'm wondering how much you've interrogated, I didn't, didn't sound like it, the actual thought process. I mean, I, I doubt very much if the person says, well, this is a man, so I will say, you know, like what goes on mm -hmm. in the, the, um, uh, you know, the conventional mind, mm -hmm. uh, the, what, what you call it, the, a uh, confirmation bias land of all mm -hmm. those biases. How does it actually work? I mean, is it you just feel like he's a you know a companion, so we'll we'll cite him? I don't know. So there's two things, yeah. uh, and the first one is statistics. I don't know whether you compensated for the fact that people yes. get to, yeah, yeah. So we do. So we do account for. Um, the seniority of the author and that seniority for us is actually a practical measure of just the number of papers that they've previously published, which is very highly correlated with the number of citations, which is correlated with, you know, the accrual of citations as well. Mm -hmm. um, so that is accounted for in the statistical model. But the second point about the psychology is really interesting. What is it that's going on in people's minds? Um, I think that 
I think that there could be a lot going on. So one simple thing is that um, there is a factor of visibility that we just might not know um, at because there because there is um, there are other places in the academy where this comes out. So we know that people who are, there's imbalances in who is asked to give keynote presentations at conferences. There are imbalances in who is asked to write a review article for um, Nature Reviews Physics, for example. Um, so we already know that there are biases in who gets asked to have these very visible roles. So that means that for many of us, we might not um, know people in, in a fair and equitable way in our field. So that's one thing. Um, and so maybe we just don't know them and we th therefore we don't cite them. But another thing that I think could also be happening is that um, we may be you know, searching through Google Scholar or PubMed or, or Archive or whatever your favorite um, um, spot is to be finding new papers. And we may look at a paper and see a particular set of names and implicitly judge that work as likely to be strong and rigorous and you know it may also have to do with the um, university where the people are from whether that's a very prestigious university or not a prestigious university um, it could be the country uh, that the people are from um, where that university is located there are all kinds of factors in that authorship spot and the affiliations that we could implicitly be using to associate a value um, to that piece. And that may determine whether we click on it and read it. So right. it's, it's possible that there are these sort of small insidious things that are happening um, that we just don't know to stop ourselves doing that. As a follow-up, I, I think I remember some research about 10 years ago, I think it was, about um, the the discrimination uh, against Canada, like uh, and a specific uh, person, uh, this one author, I believe, maybe around the same time, uh, found a gold mine because he could find all these really good papers and stuff, and he would like, oh, we discovered this thing. Well, why did you look, Canada? <laughs> you know, like, yeah, well, why don't you look at women's published? Maybe you'll find some. Maybe you'll find some in Canada. Yes, exactly. That's funny. Hmm. So, Saristan? Uh, I have um, the original question is uh, just like ads, but uh, I think I'll change another one. I I'm curious about the calculation or the arithmetic, uh, arithmetic uh, calculation about the words, because mm -hmm. in my opinion, I think words and um, these kind of arithmetic calculation somehow reveals how we organize concepts, how our consciousness organizes concepts, because if we were to understand something, we we need to incorporate the concept into our language system. So have you tried to explore other arithmetic uh, calculations like uh, multiplication or even integral, like this calculus thing? Because I think um, if other calculations doesn't work out, it sort of means that our uh, consciousness, consciousness is only able to organize things uh, quite simply. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, so I don't know a good answer to the first part of your question about different kinds of arithmetic with the um, vectors. But what I do know is from, that may be relevant to your question is from my second hat as a neuroscientist. Um, and that is that there is a piece of your brain that's called the hippocampus that you use to map physical spaces. You map distances between things, um, you map, map the geometry of the space, you map, map uh, locations, landmarks, et cetera, in the hippocampus. What is fascinating is that you also map conceptual spaces with the exact same piece of tissue. And it seems like you're using the same computations as well when you're mapping conceptual space as when you're mapping a physical space. So that indicates to me that the way that we are moving through the physical world is a similar way to the way that we're moving through conceptual worlds. And therefore, the, and the, the, the sort of calculations we do with distances, we also do with concepts um, in the same the same uh, neural structure. Oh, so 
um, because uh, I I was thinking about um, how to how do we constrain the dimensions of our uh, consciousness. It's like um, when we uh, if we were to model our consciousness, uh, how many dimensions need to be uh, incorporated? It just um, seems like if the statement you uh, you have just mentioned is true, then I think uh, somehow we can describe our consciousness our consciousness in uh, Euclidean space because we're moving in space time. Uh, space time is <laughs> basically a uh, Euclidean space. So I don't know, and just some fantasy. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're getting out here into speculation, but I do wanna speculate a teeny bit with you there, which is, um, and, and specifically what I wanna say is that I think it's likely that humans are, um, are doing this kind of mapping in a relatively low dimensional space in order to minimize the computational complexity of the model that they're working with at any particular moment in time. Um, and then there needs to be a mechanism to ratchet up the dimensionality so that when the system, when the sort of conceptual space needs to have a conformational change or do something different, or you need to pull in a different one, a new dimension and dismiss another one. So there's, I think, it's likely that humans try to be working in a low dimensional space and then must have a mechanism for changing that space as needed. Thank you, this is very interesting. Thank you. So Danny, I have a question about the methodology part of the citation studies. Mm -hmm. Do they yes. exclude self-citation? Yes, they well, exclude self-citation, yes. Okay. Okay. There are large gender differences in self-citation as well. Um, and we didn't want that to be driving the results. Any more questions? If not, let's thank Danny again for this very interesting talk. Thank you so much for having me.